Uh, I'm Peter Thorstensen. I'm from uh, Accelerate. It's basically a Danish uh, accelerator uh, that have been working in this market for eight years. So have a little bit of uh, experience. Been working with uh, 275 uh, startups, so uh, seen a lot of startups. Invested in almost uh, 75 of those. So also have a little bit of insight into, um, into uh, the startup environment uh, and investing in startup. But basically, I want to start in a totally different place. Uh, and I was actually hoping that the intro would be the, the, the anthem from the U, U, uh, UEFA uh, Champions League, because I'm so fascinated by sports. Uh, and I also always wanted people that, uh, that, uh, that you're going to hear a lot of kind of sports analogies. Uh, and I have two passions, one in entrepreneurship and one in sports. And I'm uh, kind of constantly trying to, uh, to combinate those two, uh, two things. So uh, I will start out with uh, with uh, with sports. There you go. They were looking for it. As Thank you very much. There you go. The um, and basically, there are three things in sports that really, really fascinates me. Uh, and the first thing in sports that fascinates me is kind of why why do some region kind of constantly and consistently uh, kind of perform really, really top performers? So you have Jamaica producing uh, 100 meter runners. Uh, you have Denmark producing uh, rowers. You have Brazil. Uh, uh, producing uh, good football players uh, and stuff like that. So why do some regions overperform others and actually do it in really, really consistently? So that's one thing that, that interests me with sports. The second thing that interests me in sport is, well, what does it take to be a top athlete? So what, what is it from the individual perspective that makes a top athlete? What is kind of the DNA of a top athlete and what do they do to become top athlete? And the third thing that really interests me about sport is kind of the systematics that you operate in, in sports in finding talents, developing talents, and turning them into stars. I, I haven't seen no other area than sports where you have this systematics, where you kind of constantly try to study what does it take to, uh, what does it mean to be a talent, how do we develop talent, and how do we create uh, big uh, sports stars. And, but to, in order to look into the first thing about kind of the, uh, the, the difference between uh, different sports club and different uh, regions, uh, I have a kind of recent example. Uh, and of course, it, this is a recent example. Uh, and if you don't know it, Barcelona won uh, the UEFA Champions League this year. Uh, and uh, they have done so uh, a couple of times uh, the last years. But if you look at kind of football, you say, well, there are other clubs. There are other football clubs with exactly the same uh, resources, with exactly the same amount of money, but they are not performing as well as Barcelona. So basically, you say in football, you have two strategies, right? One is the strategy that Chelsea is uh, pursuing. You get a rich Russian on board, and you start by playing, uh, start by paying and buying really, really expensive players in the kind of plus 20 million euro uh, market. Or you can apply another strategy, uh, and that is actually a strategy that Barcelona, you can start say, well, how do we find the 14 years old? And how do we attract them to Barcelona? How do we attract them to their kind of talent academy that they call uh, Messiahs? And how do we then practice them uh, to becoming uh, kind of top uh, players, both for our own club, but also for other clubs in Europe? And if you kind of look at the overall results, you can argue, well, Chelsea is probably doing as good as Barcelona in terms of number of, uh, of uh, winning the league, uh, number of uh, championships and stuff like that. But if you look at the business model and if you look at kind of the economic results, it is really, really different. And one way to kind of measure the economics uh, of football is, of course, well, how big a proportion of the world's kind of top uh, players is produ produced in different kind of clubs. And here in the first, you can see that Barcelona is up there at the top, producing the most uh, important and kind of the best players that goes to other clubs. But secondly, you can also see that Barcelona is actually producing a lot of players themselves so that actually go to their first team and start kind of building uh, Barcelona. And if you look at the economics of that, it is so much cheaper to go for the model where you look, at, look for 14 years old instead of the model where you want to buy really, really expensive, uh, expensive players. So that is kind of interesting. And next question is, of course, how can you run that model? What, is, what, kind, of, what kind of world uh, does uh, affect around uh, that model? And that model is actually only working in a world where you have extreme mobility. So basically, you can hunt players all over the world. You have an idea of what you are looking for in terms of talent. 
you have an idea of how you want to train and practice them, and you have an idea of what is kind of the way that we want to play the game. So if we turn to a little bit to entrepreneurship and say, well, what is the trends in entrepreneurship? And basically, you have some of the same trends. First of all, you have extreme mobility in uh, entrepreneurship. So basically, startups from all over the world are willing to move and willing to move to the place where they can see, well, here I can increase my chance of, uh, of, uh, of succeeding. The next thing that we see is, well, you see reduced cost in getting to the point uh, where you have the product market fit. So basically, we can reduce the cost. So it's so much cheaper today to build a startup from the original idea and coming to the point where you can say, well, now we have a product market fit. The third thing that we see in startup is, well, you see a lot of kind of alternatives uh, in financing. You can go to accelerators, you can go to Kickstarters, you can go a lot of different places and raise money. So basically, you have more alternatives and, and, and a lot of other stuff that you can do compared to just five years ago. And the fourth thing that we see is, well, we're starting to build the framework. We are starting to kind of understand what is the methodology of building a startup. Some call it lean startup. Uh, there are other kind of methodologies, but we are starting to, to get a, a, um, a language around what does it take to become a successful startup. And then the last thing that we can see is that we can actually, as startup, build our startup uh, on better data. So basically, the startups built today is building all the knowledge that has been produced for the last thousand years and the easy access to that knowledge uh, through the web, through mobiles and stuff like that. So we can actually start our startup at a higher uh, level of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge. So in that sense, startup world is actually looking a little bit like the, uh, like the football world. The next question is, of course, well, if we look at it from the individual perspective, so if you are entrepreneurs, what does it take to become successful? And we do the kind of the comparison again with sports stars and say, well, uh, what does it take to be a top athlete? Uh, and we have been studying that for many, 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 many years. And basically, you can boil it down to four things, right? One is, of course, it takes a bit of talent. Then it takes a huge amount of hours of practice. It takes a huge kind of quality of practice. And then it takes what you would call the kind of the right social context. And by the right social context, people mean, well, you are part of an environment where you aspire to become better. You are basically uh, at the football club of Barcelona. So you look around, you play with the best players in the world. And by that, you start aspiring to become better and better and better. And I've always had this kind of question say, what if entrepreneurship is basically the same? What if you can build entrepreneurship around the model that you build football clubs? at least a successful one. So in order to figure that out, of course, there has some kind of preconditions that has to be in, uh, in place in order to do that. And one precondition is, of course, well, you start up and building successful startups has to have something to do with learning and training. So you have to practice in order to be good. If you look at kind of history and literature around startups and entrepreneurship, you've basically been studying this from four angles, so four different perspectives. And the first perspective is kind of the talent idea. So basically the idea that startups or entrepreneurs has a special kind of DNA. So they are touched by God in some special way, beaten in their upbringing or some other thing. So they have a unique kind of mindset and a unique mind and we can actually start building method around figuring out what that is. The second way of looking uh, at startup is looking at startup as experience. So basically the idea that the more you do it, the better you get at it. The third idea that you've been looking into is of course, well, shouldn't we look at startups from the perspective of the, the innovation? So looking at the idea, the creative process of coming up with a great idea, coming up with the next Uber, the next Google or whatever. So we need to understand kind of startup from the perspective of, well, is this a good, this a good idea or not? And then in recent weird years, you actually start uh, studying startup as a learning process. So basically something you can learn if you have a bit of talent and you have the willingness uh, to, to, uh, to strive the extra mile and really, really start uh, learning. We've done a little bit of study ourselves. Uh, so basically we took uh, 60,000 startups uh, in a database. We followed those startups for 20 years and try to figure out what is the relationship between the number of startups that you do and the likelihood of succeeding. And our idea was, well, if this is about the talent, so if people have a special DNA, we could basically divide this into two groups, right? 
a larger data pool divided into two groups. One that has the talent and the others that doesn't have the talent. And the ones that has the talent should kind of constantly outperform the ones that don't have it. Unfortunately, we couldn't find that in our data set. The next idea was, well, if we look at it from the perspective of experience, the more you do a startup, the higher the likelihood of success, right? So if you do your first startup, second, third, fourth, you should have basically a higher likelihood of succeeding because you're starting to learn the methodology of how to build a startup. In this study, we only find, we all follow the individuals. So basically, we don't care what they are doing. We don't care whether they do ICT, or biotech, or whatever. So we, we look at only the startup team and the startup founder. And our idea was, well, if, 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 it's, if it's kind of the innovation, then people are either uh, kind of more creative, uh, kind of more innovative in others, and then we should find it in the talent pool. But basically, following the individuals, if we're looking at the innovation, we shouldn't be able to find a pattern. What we found was this curve that is, in my mind, extremely interesting. And what does this curve say? Well, we measured kind of success in three different ways. One is uh, survival of the startup. The second is growth of the startup. And the third is kind of the income of the, uh, of the founder team. So how much money are they earning? Uh, and the idea is that kind of the, the curve is similar no matter how we measure success. And what this curve is basically saying, let's, say, let's take the simple measure of success. Well, do you survive the company within the three, first three, three years? We know from statistics that kind of the first startup that you do, you have almost 50% chance of succeeding uh, or dying, <laughs> depending on what you, uh, or how, you, uh, how you see it. Uh, but 50% of the company not surviving the third year. Second time you start a company, you decrease your chance of success. Third time you start a company, you get back to the likelihood of first time. And then basically the curve starts uh, raising exponentially. Uh, and this is kind of a logarithmic scale, so it's a little bit hard to see. But when you do your fourth and your fifth venture, you have 80% chance of succeeding. And then, of course, you can argue, well, if you've done it four or five times, then you build the experience and stuff like that. But the interesting thing is to figure out, well, what's it, what is it people do differently when they do five, four or five startups? So what is it that they do differently? So can we start figuring out, well, what is it that these kind of serial entrepreneurs are doing differently? And the second question is, of course, can we turn that into learning? Can we turn that into methodology? So when you start your first company, you actually start at a higher level of knowledge and with a better methodology uh, of how to run your, uh, run your startup. And this is kind of what we try to focus at, uh, at, at, at in, in, in what we are doing. So basically we're saying, well, to build a startup, you need three things, right? You need a bit of talent. And the talent is probably like what you see in Sportstar. It's the talent of actually going that extra mile. It's the talent of being willing to uh, stay up uh, to 12 o'clock in the evening and keep on practicing even when it gets really, really tough. Then, of course, you need a lot of insight. So basically, insights into your technology area, your market area. So you need to understand what you're doing. And then you probably need kind of some kind of methodology on how do you run the process of figuring out where you're working with uh, an extremely interesting startup. And of course, you can f probably figure out the method of how do we spot the talent. You can certainly kind of get a lot of input uh, from experts in the market. And of course, you can also start, well, how do we build the methodology uh, around being a startup? And in order to build the methodology, of course, we have to understand a little bit what is a startup. And basically, this is a kind of the definition of Deep Blank. I say, well, a startup is basically a company or an intermediary organization searching for a scalable business model. And by a scalable business model, we mean the point where you exactly know what product we are going to uh, produce, who are our customers, what is the pricing, who are we, how we get to them, how do we sell, and stuff like that. At that point, you start executing on your startup. And in, in a lot of skills and a lot of people out there are extremely good at executing known business model. Because this is what we do in large corporations, right? Large corporations is about executing existing and known business model. Startup is about searching for that scalable business model. And it's a total different type of skill, kind of the process of searching compared to the process of, uh, of executing. And of course, there's a lot of phases in a startup life. So finding problem solution fit, product market fit, building efficiency, and, and eventually finding a scalable business model. But this is a search process. And it's kind of the skills to run that search, pro search process efficiently that defines whether you're going to be successful or not. And if you ask kind of really, really uh, kind of, of uh, experienced entrepreneurs and say, well, what are you doing, guys? 
So how do you build your startup? They come up with this extremely simple concept, right? The first thing they say is, of course, well, startup is built by actions. It's not built by strategy. It's not built by whiteboard. It's not built by business plan. It's built by actions. So basically, if you are a startup, you make 5,000 decisions a year, right? The way you do the decisions and the way you think about your startup is, well, you start kind of formulating assumptions. You, you start formulating hypotheses. We think, we believe, and, uh, and, and, and we think that this is going to work in the market. And then you start kind of building a lot of experiments to figure out, well, are our assumptions right or are they, are they actually wrong? And then for those kind of experiments in the market and with your technology, you, of course, you get a lot of feedback. So you get data, you get information, you get people telling you, well, we don't like it or whatever. And from that, if you're really, really good, you can start figuring out what are the patterns of that feedback, and then you can start building the concept. Or you figure out your assumptions were wrong, and you start the process all over again. And what you're looking for in this process is evidence, real hard evidence that this is working. Either technology evidence, market evidence, or of course both uh, if you're really, really uh, lucky. If you look at kind of all startups life, you know that all startups have been through seven to 10 of these iteration in coming from the original idea to actually the business model that scales uh, at a certain point in time. And if you take this example of Google, Google started out to be a company doing a search engine. Uh, they want to sell that to Yahoo. Yahoo said, well, we don't like it, uh, so we want to buy it. Then they went to say, well, now we're doing a search engine for graduates uh, of Stanford. Uh, and as part of uh, being part of Stanford, wasn't really a business model around that. Uh, it took Google five years to figure out, well, what is the business model around Google? It took them five years to come from their original idea to the model that actually scales today. Uh, so this is actually really, really uh, interesting. And all startups go through uh, these types of iteration in order to find their scalable business model. And the idea of, uh, of running a startup is, well, how fast can you do uh, the iteration? And with how, uh, which type of uh, quality? And how uh, little money can you spend on running these iterations? If you can get those through three things to work together, then basically you can do more iteration and then increase your likelihood of success. And therefore, in my mind, there's a really, really simple formula for success in, uh, in a startup life. And this says, well, uh, the likelihood of success is basically an equation of the number of input that you get times the quality of the input times your team's ability to transform those input into concrete actions. Of course, then divided by some measurement or are you working with a good idea or not? And if we put this into really, really simple economics, what this saying is simply say, well, if you live in, a, live in a world with full information of the highest quality, and you have kind of all the resources in the world to translate that input into action, and you are working with the best idea in the world, what is the likelihood of success then? Well, 100%, of course, right? But the problem is that if you are a startup, you don't have all the input in the world. You may not have the highest quality. You certainly don't have a lot of resources. And you are probably not working with the best idea in the world. So you have to change it. So the whole idea is that what you are looking for as a startup is say, well, how can I increase the number of input? How can I increase the quality? And how do I practice the way of translating uh, those input into, uh, into, uh, into action? And I think that is the iterative process. And running that iterative process is like training a muscle. The more you do it, the better you get at it. So basically what we do in Accelerate is only say, well, we train you in running that iterative press process and nothing more. Because we think that is what you need in order to build a scalable business model. And the second thing that we do is say, well, we know there are costs in, in running such a, uh, such a model. And therefore we look at say, well, how can we provide you with the input? How can we kind of make you able of doing all the small time experiments and how can we do that really, really cost efficient. So the idea is how can we decrease the cost of running the iterative process by building knowledge into the market, by having a lot of customers willing to talk to you, by making it easy to do the experiments in the market. And what we are looking for is kind of the, the, the curve in the, la, in, in the uh, lower left uh, corner, you say, well, usually what we see is that the risk reduction per cost is really, really slow in the beginning of a startup life. But if you do this iterative, train the iterative process and have easy access to do all these experiments, you can actually kind of, of reduce the risk uh, per cost even faster 
uh, than you would uh, be able to uh, otherwise. And usually I say to startup, that, well, there's only four things that, are diff that, is, that is really, really difficult running a startup. And the first thing is defining kind of your assumptions. So how do we kind of think and work in assumptions? Usually what you see in a startup when you go to investors, and we saw that a little bit earlier, say, well, you have to go to investors and say, well, I'm doing uh, this technology. It is tapping into exactly this market, and I know the customer will like it. Have you ever seen a pitch that say, well, I think my technology will work. I assume that the customer will like it, and I assume the market is so big. You would probably not get four minutes uh, in an investor room, right? So you are used to think in absolutes and kind of absolute things. The world is like this. But it is so rare that the world is like we assume it is. So how do we kind of train the muscle of thinking in assumptions? And the funny thing is that we all kind of, probably a lot of us coming out of university and higher education and stuff like that. And what, could be, what, do, what do we get taught there? We get taught to think in, in assumptions because this is the way you do science. As soon as we get to be a startup, we, we forget about that. Then we think, well, the thing is like this. I, I, think, I don't think, I know it is like this. So read any business plan. It is 30 pages of, well, the world is like this. And as an investor, I say, hmm, maybe or maybe not. But what I want to build your, uh, your, your, uh, your startup and your venture on is, well, what do you assume? What do you think? Uh, and, and, and how will you actually prove that to me? So when we look at, at startups, say, well, we want their assumption and not what they can tell us about the world, but what do, do, uh, how do they assume it uh, in, their, uh, in their own mind? So how do we work kind of constantly with assumption and not, well, the world is like this? The second thing that is really, really tricky with startup is, well, you can have probably 5,000 assumptions around your startup, right? So you can have 5,000, I think, I think, I believe, whatever. Uh, so how do you prioritize that? So how do you find the assumptions that are kind of driving value into your startup? So how do you focus on the things that say, well, if this is not true, then we are heading for problems, right? So how do you get to, uh, down to those three to five things that you have to prove in order to say, well, now we are actually on the right track? Or how do you go to get to those three things and figure out, well, our assumptions were wrong and we have to build new ones? And the third thing that is difficult around startup is, well, how do you design experiments? So basically, how do we build real experiment, experiments in the market that give us data, that give us insight, that we can actually test our assumptions? Usually, kind of, uh, uh, usually what we see is, well, first of all, you don't do the experiments really well. Uh, and, and, uh, and when you do it, you don't know what kind of data you are looking for because you don't know what assumptions you are actually kind of wanting to, to, uh, to test. So how is the art of designing experiments? And then the last thing is, of course, how do you interpret the, interpret the feedback that we get? So when we have 10 customers telling, well, we like it or we don't like it, or uh, three like it or four don't like it, and two maybes and whatever, how do we interpret that data? How do we figure out, well, hmm, is this actually proof of our assumption or is it kind of not proof of our uh, assumption? And one kind of really uh, concrete example, uh, when I've been working with startups, I've been participating in customer meetings with, uh, I think, 200 startups uh, to figure out, well, what is going on there? Uh, and usually I have the question, uh, this question for startups uh, afterwards and say, well, how do you think that customer meeting went? And uh, of the 200, I think 199 was saying, well, it went great. It went fantastic. They were showing us all the buying signals and stuff like that. Uh, and then we just need to sit by uh, the phone and wait a little bit and then uh, they will call and we will have the, uh, have the order. But if you are sitting into that market and like, into those meetings with kind of no, uh, kind of not a lot of feelings in there, you can hear all the yeses and the butters and stuff like that. So in order to interpret feedback, again, you have to focus on your assumption and to be extremely uh, pr uh, kind of precise your assumptions say, well, if they are saying this and this and that, then we believe our assumptions are right. And if they say this and this and that, then we believe our assumptions were actually not in the way we thought they were. So you have to predefine what is actually the outcome uh, of the meetings and the uh, data that we are collecting, uh, collecting in the market. So, so, and these are only the four things that, that are, are extremely difficult when running a startup and searching for that uh, scalable business model. But as I said, I really think that this can be uh, taught. I think that this can be learned, but it takes a lot of time. 
it basically takes 10,000 hours uh, of practice. Because from sports, we know that it takes basically 10,000 hours to become good at anything. And, and why shouldn't startup and why shouldn't kind of venturing uh, be exactly the same? And this may be one of the problems with kind of traditional accelerators and also our accelerator. Well, if startup, if it's about learning, if it's a learning process, we don't get engineers in two years and we don't get engineers in three months, right? It takes time. So therefore, when looking for accelerators, also look for, well, how can this, this is part of the learning process. This is part of the 10,000 hours. It is not the 10,000 hours when you go to an accelerator. So why do startups fail? In my mind, well, they basically run out of learning. So they run out of either good inputs, they run out of quality of input, or they run out of the ability to translate that input into actions. And then eventually they run out of cash, of course. But they're, 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 the speed of their iteration and the speed of their learning is too slow, and therefore they run out of cash. So speed in learning is actually key to building a startup. So constantly, how do we transform data into action? That is kind of the key. And how do we practice that in the real world? And again, looking at sports, it's so interesting. Say, would we build a fantastic football player by running them through a three-month program? Would that be a successful model? Probably not, right? They train for five years in order to become good football players. So how do we build system uh, for practicing, uh, uh, practicing entrepreneurship? in a real, really fashion matter. And the problem when practicing entrepreneurship is like practicing football. You have to do it. You cannot learn it in a classroom. So you have to play the game in order to learn it. And therefore, you have to be a startup, you have to build a startup, but when you are, you can actually start uh, structuring the way of how you learn uh, this process. And then, of course, uh, but this, does this work? And this is just some of our numbers. You can get them afterwards. Uh, high survival rate, of course, a lot of value increase and stuff like that. But as we heard before, maybe these are the wrong measures uh, of, uh, of how successful accelerators are. Because, well, we should be focusing on the learning process and understanding how do a team learn and how can we actually provide them with the skills that they need to build a scalable business model. So that's at least our the idea and kind of the way that we operate and way we work with the startups. Uh, and I think you can do the comparison with the uh, sports. And, and as I said in the beginning, I think it's so fascinating. In sports, you have built this extreme systematics of how do we look for talent, how do we practice them, and how do we then finance them and, and turn them into sports stars. And just think about if we spend just 10% of that logic and that systematics within uh, the world of startup, I think we could create a little bit better results than we usually see uh, in this world. So that should be all for me. Hopefully uh, you didn't fall asleep, all of you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, hopefully uh, this gave a little bit of inspiration uh, at least to how we think about startups and how you can have to think about accelerators probably in a new way in our mind. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Stay on stage, don't worry. Uh, as anyone has a question, I know I keep asking this, and you guys are very slow this afternoon. I know lunch has been good, but uh, wow. No? Yes? No? Oh, there's one. I'm going to run to you, sir. Don't worry. And thank you. I appreciate it, actually. Uh, yeah, so that was fascinating uh, charts and data on founders, startups. I uh, hadn't seen that before, especially with uh, the past uh, number of startups and how they correlate. So in your investment decisions or in your backing decisions, uh, are these the kinds of conversations you have? Oh, you're, uh, you know, perhaps you're a first time founder, so maybe we need to match you up with somebody who's done this before. How do you work to get that kind of mentorship program for, for founders and really bring that know-how there since it obviously works? Yes, uh, and, and, and basically there are two questions in what you are asking. One is, well, how do you fund, uh, so how do you finance startup with, the, with this mindset? Uh, and, and, the, and the second is, well, how do you do mentoring and, uh, and how, do you, how do you build the learning process of actually being, uh, being uh, successful? So let me start with the latter part and say, well, in my mind, what it is, is a little bit like, uh, you know, the movie Star Wars, right? 
In Star Wars, you have an apprentices model. So basically, you are building, say, well, we have someone who's really experienced Jedi, uh, and then we have a more inexperienced people, and they learn by seeing how the master operate in the field. And to some extent, I actually think that you can learn a little bit from the same. So basically say, well, in our accelerator, what we do is, is actually we bring people on board. Uh, so we have peop our own people that are kind of serial entrepreneurs, and they have to work for the company with the mindset of being kind of that apprentices model. They don't take over the company, uh, but they say, well, for a period of time, we will actually be actively uh, participating in how you develop your startup. We will set up the meeting, we will help you, we will be participating in the meeting. But the idea is, well, you can actually learn something uh, from seeing how we, uh, how we do it. So that's basically the learning uh, philosophy. For the investment philosophy, of course, this is a really, really tricky thing because if you believe in this, right? <laughs> if you believe in this model, you shouldn't take equity in any company, right? Because the problem with equity is actually you are taking the risk on the company, not the founders. So basically what you should, you should do, given this graph is, well, how do I take an upside in the entrepreneur? Not in their startup, because I know that, well, you may succeed or you may fail the first time, doesn't matter. You may succeed or fail the second time, but if you keep on doing it, at some point you would actually, actually succeed. So if I was a really, really good investor, I would take upside in you as a person <laughs> and basically say, well, I will invest in your present venture if I am allowed to invest in all your future adventures as well. That would be the right investing model uh, that you should be operating in this market. Unfortunately, I, I, it, it, it gets so close to be slavery <laughs> that is probably not allowed in, uh, in uh, Europe and another, a lot of other places, but basically that should be the mindset of an investor. And if you look at it, if, if I owned a small percentage of uh, Andrew Musk, you know, the PayPal guy who's now doing Teslas and uh, stuff like that, I would probably be tremendously rich today. But if you look at, at his, uh, his history, he's also had a lot of failures. And the problem is you cannot, a, a startup can fail for a lot of reasons that basically have nothing to do with the quality of the founder team. So, so basically, if I was to invest in startup in the future, I would invest in the people and mean it. And me say, well, I will invest in your guys, but uh, I want a, an option to invest in all your future ventures as well. Maybe that uh, could be a little bit of a new way to invest in uh, startups. Well, I have time. I actually, I don't have time, but I'll still open the floor for one more question if somebody wants to pick one. Yes, no, three, two, no. Well, in that case, thank you so much. Please applaud him. Thank you. Mm -hmm.